Good afternoon and welcome to the next in our series of virtual classes brought to you in a partnership between the Smithville Area Chamber of Commerce and the Smithville Public Library, along with some funding sources that I'm going to allow our uh, library director, Judy Bergeron, to tell us about. Judy. Thank you very much, April. I am excited to bring this another in this series of uh, web-based trainings for small businesses and nonprofit organizations. It comes to us through a grant from the um, Institute for Museum and Library Services through the Texas State Library and Archives Commission. And it is through CARES funding because we are trying to help our small businesses and organizations get through this COVID and help us realize the new normal. And Kevin's got some great tips for us today about creating loyal customers. So thank you all very much for being here. Thank you very much, Judy. Uh, and as you heard from Judy, um, we have a wonderful speaker here today with us, Kevin Hutchinson, who is going to talk with us about creating loyal customers. Kevin, I will turn it over to you. Great. Well, thanks everybody for being here. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to, I'm kind of a Leadite when it comes to high tech, so I'm not going to have a snappy little PowerPoint or anything like that. I actually have uh, actual words on paper which we're gonna archive along with this talk. And if you'd like to get a copy of these, um, I'll provide my email address at the end of this and you can just uh, email me and I'd be happy to email them to you. But um, I'd like to start off with just talking a little bit about my business and why I kind of feel like I'm qualified to talk about building loyal customers. Um, I own three different businesses, but we're primarily gonna talk about my fly fishing guide business today. Hill Country Fly Fishers, which has been in existence for 28 years. Um, the average life of a fishing guide, a fly fishing guide in Texas is about five years. They usually get tired of losing money after about five years and kind of uh, call it quits. And we've been going 28 years, so I must be doing something right. Um, along with that, uh, we keep a lot of detailed uh, demographic information about our customers. And uh, my return rate or my return customer rate is about 85%, which is astronomical. Um, if uh, car dealerships had 85% return rate, they'd be pretty happy. So we're doing something right. And what I'm gonna try and explain today is what we do and how we do it. And hopefully you'll have some questions at the end here so that I can, um, I can uh, answer those questions that may be specific to your business. So the very first thing we have to do when we start talking about creating a customer or building a, a loyalty in a customer is we have to kind of define what our business actually is. Um, what do we do? And that sounds like a really easy question to answer, but for some people, it can be a little complicated. Uh, people very often when they start a business, they have you know pretty grand ideas and they kind of want to go for the back wall. So you know they want to be everything to everybody. And that usually doesn't work. You really need to kind of hone in and, uh, and focus on what you're doing. So in order to really adequately find your customers and to, to, to build your customer base, you have to understand what you do. And we were very clear about that when we started Hill Country Fly Fishers. Um, I started it with a partner and who I, about five years into it, actually bought out and uh, became the sole owner of the business. But we were very specific about what we wanted to do. We wanted to provide a blue ribbon guiding experience. Um, we didn't care about cost. We didn't care about anything. We wanted to build something that we could be proud of and that we would attract a certain demographic as far as income goes, client base. And we were very successful at that. And it was a bit of a two-edged sword because now 28 years into it, our client base is getting old. <laughs> we we kind of make a joke about it now that we lose customers every year, but we simply lose customers to the calendar. Um, we have guys that just literally pass away. But we have uh, fished with the same clients, some of them for the entire 28 years that we've been in existence. And we've seen them have children, and we've seen those kids grow up, go to college, get married and have children of their own. And we've actually just now have started to fish 
with our third generation of people. So that's kind of a kind of a cool um, uh, kind of a cool deal. So anyway, you've got to have a clear definition of what your business is and what you're doing. Um, and then you've got to define who your customer is, who you want to be your customer. And uh, there's a very distinct split in my business. Um, and it's kind of funny. Uh, and this is kind of, you know, inside dope that nobody really cares about. But there are two guide businesses in Central Texas that are as big as I am. And um, both of them have extremely di different demographics than I do. Um, one of them is an outfit called All Water Guides uh, that's led by Alvin Dido. And Alvin is just about my age. I'm 58. I think Alvin is 57. But if you were to look at his website, you'd swear that he was 30. Um, he courts the 30 year olds very hard. He is super active on uh, Instagram. He's super active on social media. He's all over the place on Facebook and on LinkedIn. And um, he has a much, much younger client base than I do. And that was a direct choice that he made. He was going to go after that market and he went after it and he got it and he owns it. Uh, that, that demographic, he definitely owns. Um, whereas my demographic is much older. Now you can argue that one's better than the other. It doesn't really matter. Both of us are prospering. We're doing great. We're happy with our, with our demographic. Um, mine's aging out a little bit faster than his, but, um, you know, we've made conscious choices on that. Another thing that we, I made a choice very early on in my business was I looked at the most underserved markets in fly fishing. And the most underserved market at the time, very simply, was women. Nobody, nobody catered to women. And I made a very conscious decision to be that guy. And so because of that, I sought out programs like Becoming an Outdoor Woman through Texas Parks and Wildlife, I taught in that program for 11 years, longer than any other instructor has ever taught. I've probably given fly casting lessons to more women than anybody in the state of Texas and probably in the country. Um, and because of that, I have a very high percentage of females that fish with me. Um, it's still a very underserved market. It's still a market that I court very hard. I do a lot of stuff with the Texas women's fly fishers. I do a lot of stuff still through parks and wildlife. And there's a bunch of other organizations that I do things for, but that is a market that I believe is completely underserved. And because of that, I want to be that guy. I want to be the go-to guy. So I've kind of taken on that challenge and really courted that market. The funny thing is, is that the industry is a very slow industry to change. And the industry is just now starting to realize that women are awesome consumers. They're loyal, they have money, uh, they have free time, and they're motivated, and they want to learn something new. And so 15, 20 years after I started courting that market, now all of a sudden the entire industry is coming around to it. So it's, it's kind of nice to be on the, the leading edge of that. But by defining what my business does and by defining what... Um, my customer base should be, or, or I want it to be, that's the very stepping stone and the very beginning of how I start to build my loyal customer bases. Um, the other thing that you have to understand very clearly, um, and you, you ignore it at your own peril, is when you begin to think you're the only game in town, or you're somehow the best game in town, and you get a little complacent, there is another person coming up every day that wants to be a fishing guide. I see them every day on the water. I see them every day on Facebook. You know, they don't want to go to college. They get out of high school. They think a uh, fishing career is a great career because they love to fish and they decide they want to be a fishing guide. So for every, every one guide that I see, there's four or five more guys that want to be guides. And eventually they may take that jump and they may be my competition. So never, even though I've been at this for 28 years, do I ever take it for granted that I am the only game in town. And one of the ways that I stay ahead of that is that I constantly do research on who my competition is. I want to know who they are. I want to know exactly 
what they're doing, what they're offering, what they're charging. And I wanna know what their customer experience is. So very often I'll reach out to people that I know have fished with my competition and I'll quite simply just ask them, how was their trip? Was there something they liked about it? Was there something they didn't like about it? And uh, that's how we change. We're a very nimble business. For being around for 28 years, you'd think we'd kind of be set in stone, but we're very nimble. We like to change things up a lot. Um, we're very quick to, to adapt to things. Um, probably the one thing that we haven't adapted to as quickly as we should have is social media. And part of the reason is that my customers have no idea what Instagram is. They barely can understand what Facebook is. Most of them have email addresses that end in AOL.com. Um, they're very reticent to use any social media or any kind of electronic communication. Their, their communication is done via phone call, in person, on the phone. That's the way they like to communicate. So because I have an older client base, that's what my client base is. So we've been a little bit slow to adapt to that, but we have adapted. We do have an Instagram page. We do have a, a Facebook page and we do have a website um, that we, we constantly change, but we're probably not as cutting edge as we could be on that. So, so once we've defined what our business is, once we've defined what our customer is, and once we've defined what our competition is, we can kind of get down to business and start to build our loyalty, our, our customer loyalty. And one of the ways that you build customer loyalty, probably the biggest way that you build customer loyalty is very simple, is you solve a problem for your customer. Now, the word problem can be defined a lot of different ways. Obviously, if someone's going fishing, they probably don't have too many problems. If they're hiring a fishing guide at what we charge for a day, they probably don't have a lot of problems. So we're gonna define problem a little bit differently here. Um, the problem is, or, or the, the way that I'm gonna define problem is, we define what the customer really wants. What, is it, what are the people looking for? There's two kinds of customers that you get when you're a fishing guide. There's the customer that all they care about is going out and catching fish and they will do anything to do that. They will fish in the rain, they will fish in the freezing cold, they will drive five hours, they will do anything possible to catch a fish and that's their only goal. Those are the customers that I absolutely hate because they're so incredibly focused on one thing that they miss the big picture. The second type of customer that we get is the experienced customer. Now, if you've done any kind of research for your business, and if you have any kind of business where you're selling an, a, an experiential type product, you learn very quickly that what you are selling is an experience. I don't sell fish, okay? HEB, Brookshire Brothers, they sell fish. What I sell is an experience. And that experience is getting out in nature, having a great time, being very comfortable, eating some great food, having some great conversation, catching some fish, and going home with a great story. That's what counts. For my customers, that's what counts. And again, that's a function of age. For my customers, my average guy keeps talking about my customers. Let me define who they are. My customer's average age is 65. I have customers as old as 84. I have customers younger, but average age is about 65. They're retired and they're well healed. Their average income is even in retirement is over $150,000 a year. And how do I know this? I know this because I've done a lot of demographic research on people and there's a lot of places that you can find that research. I happen to be affiliated with the Orvis company, which is the biggest fly fishing company in the world. I'm endorsed by them. And they have a huge amount of demographic research on my customers because my customers willingly give them information every time they purchase things from them and I have access to that information. So my customer base is older and well healed. So they're not so interested in going out and catching fish. They've caught a lot of fish in their lifetime. Of course, they're interested in doing that. That's why they go fishing. But their number one priority is to have a good time to show the people that they bring with them a good time. The last trip I did was a building contractor and he's an older gentleman. 
he took a younger gentleman who is one of an up and coming building contractor suppliers with him. And all he cared about was that this guy had a great trip. He told me in advance, he said, I do not care if I catch one fish. I do not care if I do anything today other than impress this gentleman. And that's what I put my focus into. At the end of the day, the other guy caught a bunch of fish, had a great time, has already booked a return trip, a loyal customer. So, you know, always look at that. Discover what your customer really wants. If they want to just go out and catch fish and that's all they want to do, then that's what you do. And you do everything in your power to make that happen. But you've got to find that out from them. You've got to talk to them a little bit. You've got to do a little bit of research into kind of their personality. And you've got to be able to provide what they want. If that's what they want, that's what you give them. Another, another way to make it really a really loyal customer and to have somebody that comes back is if you make that experience seamless. If your customer can call you on the phone one time and say, you know, Kevin, I want to go fishing on the San Marcos River on April 17th. I'm going to have a friend with me and take care of it. And if you can do all of that and provide every bit of information that person needs to plan that trip and to give to his friend to plan that trip, and you can do it in a timely manner so that it's absolutely seamless. So all he has to do is drive to the launch point, get out of his car, step into your boat and have a great day. That is how you succeed. They don't wanna to have to do any work. They are not paying you so that they have to do work. When my customers show up, my boat is in the water, it is ready to go. My truck has already been shuttled down to the takeout point. All they have to do literally is get out of their vehicle, shake my hand, step into my boat, and start fishing. That's it. It's seamless. That's what they need. Another way that you can really build customer loyalty very quickly is to be flexible. We live in Texas. One day it's 80 degrees, the next day it's 30 degrees. And let me tell you, 82 year old guys don't like sitting in a boat when it's 32 degrees. And so if they booked a trip expecting to have a 70 or 80 degree day, and all of a sudden it's 32 degrees, you call them and give them the opportunity to call that trip off. You don't wait for them to call because a lot of them won't. They'll be embarrassed or they feel awkward or whatever. If I know them and I know their personality and I know that there's somebody who's just really not that rugged anymore and it's gonna be 32 degrees, I will call them and say, you know what? Maybe we should push this back a few days or a week. And most of them are retired and they're just really happy that you've done that because you've taken the pressure off them. And that's one of the things that, that really pays off in the long run because the customers begin to realize that you truly care about them. And let me say something about that, that specific scenario right now. Everybody that does what I do, 100% of all the guides in Texas require deposits on trips and I do not. And I don't do that for one simple reason. I don't want you to ever feel trapped in a date. I had some friends that booked a trip on the Devil's River with a, one of my competitors. They paid over $1,000 in deposits and COVID hit. And they had to cancel their trips. They got none of that money back. They lost $1,000 on a trip. Now, do you think they're ever, ever going to go back to that guide? Absolutely not. Now, does it cost me money when I cancel trips? You bet it does. But I take the long view. I look at, is that customer going to be happy that they're not losing out on money? That they haven't deposited money with me that they're never going to get back? Because that just leaves a bad taste in everybody's mouth. And that's not what I'm after. So none of that. No deposits. It's a very conscious choice. I'm criticized roundly by all my competitors because of that and I just ignore it. They run their business their way, I run my business my way. I've been here longer than all of them and I'll be here until I wanna quit. So no deposits, risky, risky business move, but a good business move. Um, one of the other ways, and I mentioned, I kind of brushed on this real briefly, um, but I'm gonna talk about this kind of a little more expansively. Um, be quick to respond. Because of this right here, this has shortened response time to where people have zero patience. Whereas people used to call and say, oh, call me back at your convenience. 
Now, if I don't call people back literally in an hour, they've moved on to another guide if they're not one of my established customers. Cell phones, email, texting, all that stuff has shortened the response times. So you have to come up with a way to respond to your customers. If you have a secretary or you have somebody in your office that's able to answer the phone on the first two rings, that's great. I do not. When I leave in the morning, I push off eight o'clock in the morning. I'm, not, I'm on the water until five o'clock. I turn my cell phone off. I don't want to be answering calls when I have people in the boat because what does that tell them? That their time isn't important. And that's not what I want to tell them. So I turn my phone off. If you call me and I don't answer, I'll get back with you as quickly as I can. I'll get back to you that night. But that's the key here is I have to get back with people in a timely manner. There are times that I drop the ball. I miss an email. I miss a phone call or a text. And let me tell you, people are angry these days about it. They get really upset if you don't get back with them. So I make a real effort to get back with people, to text them, to call them, to do it, contact them whatever way they wanna be contacted. But you've gotta make an effort to do that very, very quick. So once you get in that habit of answering your messages, setting up some kind of system, um, I have a program on my phone that sets reminders so if I tell somebody, you know, if they catch me in the morning before I'm ready to get on the water and I say, hey, look, I just can't talk right now. I'm getting ready to leave. I'll call you back at six o'clock. I can actually set a reminder on my phone to have an alarm at six o'clock so that I call them back because I can't possibly remember all that. But cell phones are a scourge in a lot of ways, but they help you out in a lot of other ways. So use that technology. Use what you have to, to help yourself in that response time. Response time is critical now. And especially in my business, um, I don't really have too many uh, new clients. Uh, I don't take too many new clients. Um, to get to be a client of mine these days, you have to be referred by another one of my clients because I simply don't need any more clients. I'm in a good position. I'm doing as many, as many days on the water as I want to uh, between my private clients and my corporate clients. I can fish anywhere between 150 and 200 days a year. And at age 58, that's a lot of days. And I'm not interested in too many more. So um, let me talk about another, another way to build loyal clients. And that is simply rewarding your clients for being your client. Um, we have a loyalty program. We have a little punch card program where you get a little card looks like this. Voila. And every trip you take, you get a little punch in it. And when you get five punches, you get your sixth trip for free. Now, loyalty programs are kind of funny. Uh, they're kind of like gift certificates and I'll, and I'll tell you my theory on both. Uh, the loyalty card, when I hand it to a customer, I'm very clear and I say, you keep track of this because I don't. If you lose it, that's on you. And I can honestly say probably 80 to 90% of the loyalty cards I give out, people lose. <laughs> <laughs> they feel good about them. They feel good that I gave it to them. They feel good that they've got two or three punches on it and they pretty much lose them. And uh, if it's a good customer, I'll just kind of keep track of their trips myself. And if it's a customer not so good, then I'll just say, well, sorry, you lost the card, you know, and then they feel bad because they did it because I told them in advance not to lose the card. So loyalty cards are great. I redeem probably 15 loyalty cards a year, 15 free trips a year. But understand that to get that free trip, they had to fish with me five times to get that sixth one for free. And again, let's use the car, car dealer analogy. If you bought five cars from a dealer, he could easily afford to give you a really good deal on another car or even give you one for free. He's made so much money. So we like the loyalty card. It's a fun little gimmick. Um, it actually started out as a joke. I told one of my very first customers that he said at the end of his first trip, he said, man, I, I want to do this every month. And I laughed and I said, well, every six months free. And uh, he is a retired heart surgeon in San Antonio. And he has fished with me every month for 26 years. 
Now, if you go onto my website, and I'm not going to say what my prices are here, but if you go onto my website and look what I charge for a one-person full-day trip, and then multiply that by 12 for a year, and then multiply that by 28, you will see how much money this gentleman has paid me over 28 years, and it's a lot of money. And he is a very, very loyal customer, as is his son, who grew up fishing with me also. So does loyalty, loyalty things like that pay off? You bet they do. Um, another thing that, that we give away a lot of is we call it swag. And it can be something simple like a COVID mask with your logo on it. Every fisherman has eyeglasses, eyeglass case. Just about every fisherman drinks, bottle opener, stickers, hats. They like to drink highball glasses. They like to drink beer, beer glasses. While they're in my boat, they drink water and Gatorade. Water with my logo on it, Gatorade with my logo on it. When they leave for the day at the end of the trip, it's hot, they're tired, they're sitting in their car. I hand them a water bottle, instant business card goes home with them. They feel good about it. Everybody teases me about having my logo on everything. I do have my logo on everything. If it stands still long enough, it has my logo. And there's a very distinct reason. Because when you see that Hill Country logo, I want you to think instantly of fly fishing and I want you to think of me. Just like the way you do when you see the Nike swoosh or the Coca-Cola waves or the Adidas logo, you don't need to see the name, you know what it is. And that's what I want in the fishing community. I want them every time they look at my can koozie with my logo on it, I want them to think of me and say, you know what, I should go fishing. I should book a trip. So we do give away a lot of swag. And sometimes it's just guerrilla marketing, refrigerator magnets. I put these in every gift pack that I give my customers. They don't think a thing about it. They take it out, they stick it up on their refrigerator right next to the plumbing magnet, right next to the electrician magnet. But you know what? When that wife, it's December 23rd and they don't have a Christmas present and they walk into the kitchen and see that business card, you wouldn't believe how many of them call me the day before Christmas and want a, a fishing trip. Last thing I'm gonna talk about is gift certificates um, or as far as in this section. Gift certificates are a huge portion of my business. In the, in the Christmas season, I sell probably 30 to 40 gift certificates a year. Up until this year, and COVID did something weird with gift certificates I don't quite understand yet. But up until this year, the redemption rate on my gift certificates was about 10%. Okay, I'm gonna say that again, 10%. 90% of the gift certificates that are purchased for me up until COVID were unclaimed. That is just free money, people. That is money in your pocket. Now, why are my gift certificates so low in their redemption rate? And this is something that I learned from a very shrewd businesswoman way back when. My gift certificates have no expiration date. When you get a gift certificate from the store, what is the first thing you look at? You look at how much it's worth. What's the second thing you look at? When's it going to expire? When you look at that date, what does that do? Immediately, that tells you, I've got to go spend this thing. I've got to go use it right now. I've got to use it before the, the, before the expiration date. Mine have no expiration date whatsoever on them. There's no pressure to use them. Consequently, they will get stuck in a drawer. And every year, the guy will call me and say, oh, I got this gift certificate I got three years ago. Is it still good? Absolutely, sir. Anytime, just call me up. I'll check my calendar and I'll get back with you. And I don't hear from him for two more years. Two years after that, he calls up, I got this gift certificate, five years old. Is it still good? Yes, it's still good, sir. Just bring it on in, we'll, we'll honor it. Okay, I'll get back with you. It never gets back with me. It is an amazing thing, but people will buy gift certificates for 300, 400, $500 and they will never redeem them. But the reason they do not is they feel no pressure to redeem them. There is no expiration date. How many of you have had a gift certificate that has expired and you get angry? Who do you get angry at? You don't get angry at yourself for not using it. You get angry at the store. 
for putting that expiration date on it. People never get mad at me about mine because there's no expiration date. I have redeemed gift certificates that were 10 years old and the people were absolutely floored. Now, how do I win on that situation? Well, I win because there's a whole bunch of them that don't get redeemed. And I really win because that guy who has a nine-year-old gift certificate or a 10-year-old gift certificate and he comes and fishes with me, he's already in a great mood because he's assuming that gift certificate's not worth anything anymore. And I'm telling him it's worth full value. He shows up, I'm already a leg up. I'm winning him over as a customer. I want him to come because that's what turns him into a return customer. If he never shows up, can't be a return customer. But it all starts with the gift certificate and it all starts with no expiration dates. And you will find no business coach that will ever tell you that. Because to them, it makes no sense. Because to them, that means you have thousands of dollars worth of gift certificates hanging out there that could possibly get redeemed. They're not going to people. That's not how it works. They don't get redeemed. And so the few that are going to get redeemed after a year, take them. Great. You've already got the money. You made the money. It's, it's no problem doing that. So think about that. If you offer gift certificates in your place, think about taking away that, that expiration date. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised at the lack of redemption because they don't feel that pressure to do it. All right. One of the things that my business is thoroughly based on, and anyone that has ever worked for me will tell, will tell you the same tale. Details, details, details. Let's take a look at our customer again. My customer. My customer made a lot of money. They're retired, and they can afford to go fishing and pay somebody to do it. So they obviously made some money. How did they make money? Well, most of them made money by being smart. And they realized pretty quickly that if they watched the pennies, the dollars added up. They learned to watch the details, the little things. When they walk into my boat, <coughs> they realize that my boat is clean. My boat gets washed every single trip. And that may sound really simple. When you end a trip at eight o'clock at night and you've got another one at eight o'clock in the morning, you've got a lot of stuff to do and washing the boat's pretty low on the priority list, but you do it because they don't want to sit in a dirty boat. They want to sit in a boat that is clean and looks clean. And especially now, they want to know that it's been sanitized and mine has. Um, we keep very detailed notes on our clients. On our full day trips, we serve lunches. We serve very good lunches. And um, we keep very good notes on our clients. We have, I have lots of clients that are vegan, vegetarians, regular vegetarians, uh, lactose intolerant, uh, don't like certain things, you know, have celiac disease. I mean, a million things. And we keep notes on that every time because the last thing you want to do is show up with bacon, lettuce, and tomato sandwiches for your kosher customers. So we keep very detailed notes on people on what they like, what they don't like. We keep detailed notes on people when their birthdays are. Uh, during the course of conversation when we're in the boat, very often we find out when birthdays are. Very often, husbands and wives will come out on a fishing trip to celebrate their anniversary. We write that down. The reason we write that down is simple. Because next year, when their anniversary comes up, we send them an anniversary card and say, hey, Hill Country Fly Fishers is thinking about you. It's handwritten. It's on our stationery. And we send it to them. And believe me, that pays off. The whatever postage is now, 49 cents to mail a letter, whatever total, total return on your investment. If you remember their birthday, if you remember their grandkids' birthday, whatever, it does not matter what it is, as long as you remembered it and as long as you acknowledged it, then they understand that you actually care about them as a customer. And that's what they want. They want to spend money with people that care about them. All right. Um, one of the hardest things to do is to meet customer needs. Um, and I'm going to tell this story, and, and it's, it is what it is. And if it offends somebody, I apologize. But um, I have a very expansive uh, first aid kit on my boat. Um, I take first aid very seriously. I've had some serious incidents on my boats. I've had people have heart attacks, and we've been able to deal with it. I carry epinephrine on my boat so that if you get stung by a wasp and you're allergic to it, I can give you a shot, all those things. 
But the number one thing that I carry in my first aid kit that has come in handy so many times, and I have yet to meet another fishing guide that carries them, is quite simply a tampon. And not to be crude, but when a woman needs one, she needs it. And she gets that look on her face. Now, I grew up in a single parent household with a mother and two sisters, and I've seen that look. I know what that look means. And every once in a while, I'll have a woman who's fishing with me, and she'll turn around and give me that look. And I'll just smile and say, you know what, why don't you look in that first aid kit? And they are absolutely stunned. And this recently happened to me about two weeks ago. And the woman just couldn't believe it. She just could not believe that I had thought ahead to have that on the boat. And she needed it. And I was a hero. I was an absolute hero. Now, my business relies on the money that we charge, but we're a tipping business, which I don't really care for, but it is what it is. I got a enormous tip that day <laughs> for carrying an item that cost me about 25 cents, but it was an item that was needed. So anticipating my customers' needs long before they anticipate them, that's what it's about. Okay, a couple quick things here. I see I'm running out of time. Um, stay in touch with your customers, simple to do. Um, you can do uh, Instagram posts, you can do Facebook posts. Um, I did a Facebook post today about doing, doing the Zoom meeting. Um, but again, since my customers are a little bit older, I send out a lot of cards. I send out a lot of letters um, just to touch up with them, just to stay in touch and say, hey, I haven't seen you in a while. Hope everything's okay. You know, if you feel like going fishing, give me a buzz. That's it. Real simple. Hand write them. Done and done. Um, Probably uh, the number one thing that has helped our business survive is quality standards. We have set quality standards. I, like I said, I'm endorsed by Orvis. They impose quality standards on me and they're lower than the standards I impose on myself. Um, always when we head to a trip, we look professional. We have a company shirt on. We have fishing pants on. We have nice shoes on, you know, nice fishing shoes. We have quality gear in the boat. We look professional. We pull up, we're ready to go. Our boats are clean, they're well stocked, everything looks great. Customer needs nothing. That's professionalism. Always present your business in a professional light. Be careful about things that you do, events that you do. If there's an event that you don't particularly care for, I did a, a hunting and fishing show in San Antonio a few years ago. And I got stuck next to a guy who was selling some just blatantly racist t-shirts. And I said, I'm out of here. I, I don't want to have anything. I don't want my business anywhere near this guy. I don't want to even be in the same building as him. And I literally packed up my booth and left. Where you are, who you associate with, that reflects on your business. Always think about that. Always put your business ahead of everybody else. Always put your business at the top of the heap. It's easy to be in the bottom. Be a good corporate citizen. Uh, participate in your chamber of commerce. Participate in fundraising events. Donate things. We donate over $5,000 worth of trips every year to different charities. And they're all charities that we, we all believe in. Everybody that works for my company believes in. We all talk about them before we donate to them. But we donate a lot of trips. So be a good corporate citizen. And then the last thing I can say, and, and this is one of my favorite things, is price your services correctly. Don't be the top of the heap. Don't be the guy who's way overcharging and don't race to the bottom. Charge a fair price for what you're offering. Keep track of your competitors. Don't be underpriced or overpriced. The middle is a really good place to be in a lot of ways, maybe the upper middle. But let me leave you with this last little bit of wisdom. And it's one of my all time favorite quotes and then I'll take questions. Uh, Benjamin Franklin once said, uh, it's the fool that knows the price of everything and the value of nothing. And I, I really love that quote because what I do has a lot of value and I charge appropriately for that. I don't rip people off. I don't cheat people. I charge what's appropriate and I give them their money's worth. And that my friends is why they come back. That is why I have 85% return rate. And that is why I have survived for 28 years. So hopefully some of my tips can help you a little bit and hopefully you have some questions for me. So I'll throw it back to April if she's there. There she is. 
Thank you. Wow, that was absolutely fascinating. <laughs> I'm sitting here taking copious notes. Really fantastic. Um, I have a couple of questions that actually came up in the chat that I would Great. like to share with you first. One of which is very artfully worded and a little <laughs> bit of a groaner, but that's okay. from Judy Bergeron with our okay. library. She says, I am sure you don't want to do catch and release. And then she says groan. Do you use mail marketing, email, phone calls, et cetera, to encourage clients when certain ideal fishing conditions are coming up to try to reel them back in? Yeah, very much so. I have a whole cadre of, of guys that um, will target a specific river, let's say the South Lano, it takes about four or five hours to drive out there. They don't wanna drive out there if the fishing's not good. So I have six or eight guys that, that are on a list and they have told me to put them on this list that say, okay, if the South Lano's fishing, call me, I'll be there. And so, yeah, I do some of that marketing very much. If we have a particularly good spring season or a fall season, I definitely will use email marketing. Instagram is kind of effective, but again, my customers are a little bit older, don't use that. So I use a lot of direct mail marketing more than anything with my guys. But um, we definitely do keep them apprised of what the situation is. And that's another thing that, that we've done that a lot of guys don't do. If the fishing isn't gonna be good, if I know, if I've been out for three days and the fishing's been horrible and I have somebody scheduled for a trip, I'll just call them and say, look, fishing's off. Let's just, let's just put this aside until the fishing comes back and we'll just pass on trips. And I fish in a 14 foot raft and you'd be amazed at, you'd be amazed at how small that gets when you fish for eight hours and they catch nothing. That's very small. So we've only had, and I'm very prideful of this, we've only had five trips out of the thousands we've done in 28 years where we have caught nothing. And those five trips I didn't charge them for because I felt like I let them down. But it is, it is very smart marketing and it's a very smart idea to keep your clients abreast when the fishing's good because that's when you're making your money. And it's slamming right now. And, and you know, I've got trips, I've got a lot of trips booked, so. So you mentioned a little while ago about uh, doing some direct mail marketing. Mm -hmm. What would you recommend to people, regardless of what business they're in? What, how would you target and what kinds of uh, direct mail marketing do you do to your customers? It's super easy for me because there's, there's only two fly fishing magazines still in existence. Everything has gone online. And you can simply contact those fly fishing magazines and say, I want to buy your mailing list for these zip codes. And you pick out zip codes around you. You know, for me, it would be zip codes as far as San Antonio, Austin, uh, Houston, which is a huge market for me. Houston is my number one market. So I could buy all the Houston zip codes, all the San Antonio zip codes, all the Austin zip codes. And it's not that expensive. And you get those. And you just simply send out a direct mail thing to all of those zip codes. You kind of cherry pick through them, but you can send out things like that. There, I'm lucky enough in my community is that there's fly fishing clubs. So I can buy an ad in a fly fishing club newsletter that literally will cost me $30 a year for a half page ad in a newsletter. If I book one trip, I'm tenfold flush on that deal. So targeting that market to people that I know are into fly fishing, not just sending out things to everybody or putting up a flyer at the laundromat. I mean, that's, that's ineffective marketing. You've got to target that market. You have to qualify that. And again, I don't want to keep mentioning this, but I am affiliated with Orvis. I can get the Orvis mailing list for free. I'm one of their endorsed partners, so I can get the mailing list Orvis is the biggest fly fishing company in the world. I can find out everybody that has ordered any fly fishing gear for them in the zip codes that I want to target for free. And I can send them marketing material. Super easy. So you spoke a little while ago about attending trade shows. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you target the trade shows that you think will be most effective for you? And what <laughs> specifically do you give out at those trade shows? Well, it, you, you, you go to trade shows and you learn by experience. <laughs> I'll put it that way. Um, you learn that some of them are just specifically fly fishing trade shows. So the people coming through the door are already pre-qualified. 
but those are few and far between. So a lot, you do a lot of hunting and fishing shows and those can be real hit and miss. Um, you can do one that's amazingly well organized and great. And then you can do one the next weekend that is just a horror show that you literally walk out of. And you just have to learn by trial and error on those. You start to learn the people who run them. And usually if they run a good one in Dallas, they'll run a good one in Houston. And what I give out is just a simple trifold brochure. It just says what I do, has a few fish pictures on it, has my contact information. And sometimes I'll include a little, maybe $25 off coupon. And uh, for me, the, that's very effective. What I mostly do is talk to people. Much more effective than the brochure is just sitting there talking to people. I usually set up and tie flies at the booth. People sit down. The average time in my booth for a person who's truly interested is about 20 minutes. Whereas most booths, they pick up the brochures and they just walk away. I give them something to watch. So I'm tying a fly. If it takes five minutes, they'll be there for five minutes because they want to see the whole thing start to finish. So I'm doing something rather than just sitting there and talking to them. Very often people feel intimidated by that because they think you're trying to sell them something. If you're sitting there tying a fly and just chatting about what you do, very unassuming. You're not trying to sell them anything. You are, of course you are, but it's much more camouflaged. Sure. So you talked a little bit earlier about knowing what to charge in the industry. Yeah. Can you give our viewers just a little bit more detail on that? Like how sure. would they go about figuring out what that kind of sweet spot is? So what I do is I, I always keep track of what my competition's charging. And I'm not gonna mention any names, but I'll, I'll just kind of run through it. The high end of my market, uh, people charge for a two person trip, they charge about $550 for two people for a full day. Um, that's the high end. The low end is about $325. I'm at $450. So I'm not anywhere near the high end I'm not anywhere near the bottom end. I'm closer to the high than the bottom. And the way that I look at that is that there are going to be certain people that are going to be very cost conscious and they're going to say, oh my God, I'm going to go with the $325 guy, no matter what the experience is. And then there's going to be people that are exactly the opposite. They're going to look at that $550 guy and they're going to say, oh, he must be doing something great because he's charging so much money. I prefer to go for the middle. Again, I mentioned that before. The middle is a great place. I mean, everybody wants to criticize the middle. Middle is an awesome place. I mean, if you look at anything in life, everything gets done in the middle. The extremes don't get anything done. You know, they don't make anywhere near as much. It's, it's just too much. I like that middle. I like the upper middle. So really, you've got to figure out what your costs are, how much money you're spending to actually run a trip, and then you've got to figure out how much you want to make. And then you just take it from there. So it's just simple math, but it's understanding those numbers coldly with no emotion in them. Everybody loves the idea of fishing. Everybody says, oh my God, you got the best job in the world. You go fishing all day. I go rowing all day. Nobody is paying me to fish. They are paying me to tell them where to fish and to row a boat. And that's what I do. And I have to value that at how much that that time is worth to me and so i've come up with my numbers and i keep the numbers the way they are one of the reasons my competition does not like me very much is they charge by the boat so they charge a flat fee whether there's one fisherman or two fishermen and i think that is ethically wrong if a guy likes to fish by himself he shouldn't have to pay as much as somebody who fishes two people because it's more expensive to run two people than it is one person. So I don't charge like that. Every one of my competitors charges a flat fee, no matter if it's one or two people. And I don't do that. And they have browbeat me for years to change it. And they finally just gave up because I'm never, I'm never going to change it ever. Cause that's what I believe. That's what I don't want to be charged for a premium price for something I'm not getting. Sure. So. Well, that was the last question I had for you. And I have to tell you, I have not been more entertained and really, really interested in a topic in a long time. Well, I learned a great deal. 
Um, and I hope that those of you are, that are uh, watching this uh, recorded video have learned as well. I am going to um, include in this uh, recording the contact information for Kevin, who I know would be very happy to talk with anyone that wants to call him or, or email him any questions that you have. I really appreciate your time today, Kevin. And I, as, as I said, it, that was an excellent, excellent presentation. I appreciate you so much. I appreciate it. And I appreciate everything the chamber does for me because you guys always have my back. So I'm glad I could help. Thank you, Kevin. And for those of you that are watching, I will remind you that we have lots of classes coming up uh, in, in our long list of uh, virtual classes that we are bringing to you in partnership with the Smithville Public Library. Our next class is called The Importance of Email Marketing and How It Works, which is on April 20th at 1.30. And then the next one after that, we'll finish out the month on April 27th using Facebook's Creator Studio, which is an evening class at six o'clock. So be sure and register at smithvilletx.org for those classes. And until then, we will see you next time. Thank you, everybody.